people always ask how I balance my family life with 400 shows a year. I'm just doing what I love with the people I love. It's my magic life. I like Wes Eisley. I like everything about him. All right. Today we have another legend in magic. I, You know, I keep throwing that word around, but there's some people that is just on another level. This guy is one of those guys. This guy has a dual personality. We'll get into it later on. Um, he, he's two people in one, and um, they're closer together than he likes to admit. And uh, I love this guy. We've only met a couple times, but uh, I've looked up to this guy for a long time. Everybody, it's John Lovett. What's up, buddy? How are you? Hey, I'm good. How are you? Nice to see you. Hey, we're doing great, man. I'm I'm excited. This could be a fun podcast today. I I so, think uh, I think it will be. That's that's my prediction. This will be a fun podcast. I don't I don't know where to start though. Do I start with your Let's start with your magic career. Where did your magic career start? Well, um my re magic career started quite reluctantly. I didn't get into magic until very late in life. Uh I always liked magic when I was very young. Uh but I grew up in a tiny, tiny, tiny little town in Montana where there was no magic and no magicians and, you know, no way to learn magic other than, you know, read books from the library. So in junior high and high school, I would read magic books and I tried to learn a few card tricks, but that was about it. I, I find it impossible to learn magic completely on your own in isolation. There are a few geniuses in history who have been able to do that, have been able to you know, learn to do magic almost entirely on, on your own. I'm not one of those geniuses. So I just always had an interest in magic. would watch it anytime it was on TV, anytime Johnny Carson had a magician on the show, or holy smokes when, you know, Doug Henning's magic specials would come on. Boy, that was a, that was a you know, a great day. Um, and then uh, enjoyed it, uh, uh, went to college, then I went to grad school in Seattle, and it was after grad school, I, I took a trip to New York after I graduated grad school. So I was in my, you know, late, late 20s, and I went to Tannen's Magic in New York because I had known about it since I was young and read about it in Genie Magazine because I was able to get my hands on a couple of Genie Magazines uh somehow and so i'd read about tannins and knew about tannins and i knew about abbots as well but i could never afford to buy anything from either of them so it's not like i could order for for anything because they didn't have any money but i went to tannins and bought a couple of magic books two books that were way out of my league at the time but they were great books i bought i bought the Derek dingle book because i'd always heard about you know read about Derek dingle in those few genie magazines i somehow got my hands on and i and while I was in the shop, they had Dave Williamson's Slide of Dave video playing. And I just stood there and I watched the whole video. And I was just amazed by it. And I went, does this guy have a book? I didn't ask, do you sell this video? I asked, does this guy have a book? So even then, before I knew that that was the way to go, I knew instinctually that books were the way to go so i bought the williamson book and the um derek dingle book and flew back to seattle where i was living and went to the uh went to mickey hades magic shop which which was still in uh seattle at the time and just started buying magic books and met some magicians there and just started hanging out at the shop and going to the monthly meetings at the doghouse restaurant and just got obsessed with magic and uh, just really plunged in deep, and um, and that that was how I started. And I realized I've been talking nonstop for several minutes, so I, I will pause there. But that that's why it started. Is um, I finally had access to other magicians and to magic shops for the first time in my life. What what other names came out of the Seattle area? I don't know many magicians from that area. Well, everybody in Seattle in magic at that time was named Steve. There was Stephen Minch. There was Stephen okay. Hobbs, who's written a few books. There was Steve uh, uh, Mayhew, um, who I wrote the Steve Mayhew book a few years back. Uh, uh, Steve Hobbs, Steve Minch, Steve Mayhew, 
Uh, and there were there were uh, Steve Dobson, who lived in Tacoma, which is close to Seattle, very, very skilled, skilled magician. Um, and then like there were one or two other Steves, but everybody in Seattle's named Steve. But I got to know Steve Hobbs and Steve Mayhew really well. They were way beyond me because they'd been doing magic for for years and years and years and were both great, um, both very skilled. And and Mayhew actually performed a lot. Steve Hobbs was mostly a hobbyist. And to this day, he's a hobbyist, but again, very smart, very skilled, very knowledgeable. But Mayhew actually performed magic a lot, not professionally. He always had a had a job. But at, at there would be street festivals in Seattle. And he'd set up a table, you know, uh, a table at these festivals and, you know, perform great, great close-up uh, card magic. And he's a great card magician and super funny. And they were nice enough to let me hang out with them. I had no business hanging out with them, but they sort of took me under their wing. And that was what, uh, what you know, they were my first two sort of uh, unofficial mentors. That's awesome, man. That's awesome. So um, when, you, when you're working out in Seattle, what did you go to school for to get out I got there? My, I got my MFA in theater directing at the University of Washington, the, the school of drama there. So not journalism, all the books that you've written. I understand the theatrical, I see the theatrical in you, but I thought it might be journalism no, as no. well as books. No, the so writing, the, the writing is, what, what's that? Go ahead, sorry, go ahead. Um, the writing has sort of come about sort of uh, accidentally, basically. And and you had a question, Natalie. Yeah, I was, were you working in theater then? And then, I, yeah, I did. So I stayed in I stayed in Seattle a couple of years after grad school, and uh, uh, did did some theater, directed some plays. Then I moved back to LA, and and moved back to LA where I I had lived in LA before grad school. Um, moved back to LA, and I did I did every job you could think of in theater, film, TV, and radio, uh, mostly theater, but a lot of film, TV, and radio as well. Uh, and I started going to the castle, uh, became a me member of the academy and started hanging, hanging out of the castle a lot and um, was still deep into it, but only, only as a hobby. I had no goals or aspirations or dream of doing magic professionally or full-time at all in any way. Or yeah, I didn't even have a, have a thought of performing at the castle. Um, but uh I was I was living. I had a roommate at, at the time, and I'd stay in my bedroom and I'd be, practice my magic tricks. And uh, he said, are, "Are you ever going to perform at the castle?" I'm like, "No, no." Are you ever going to? He said, "Are you ever going to perform anywhere?" And I was like, eh, "No." And he said, "What's the point of practicing a performing art if you're never going to perform it?" And I went, Drrr. "Wow, that's that's a good point." And then. All the guys about my age that were hanging out at the castle, they all started to get booked at the castle one at a time because we're all at about the same level. And um, they started auditioning, getting booked in the rooms. And then after about a year of that, I was like, hey, I want to do this too. And so I spent a year putting together an, an act for the parlor and audition and got booked. And then... I started playing the castle a lot. Back then, if you were local, uh, it wasn't uncommon to play the castle like five, six times a year. Uh, and so I was playing the castle like five or six times a year. And so from that, I started getting booked for parties and things like that. And gradually over the course of 10 years, magic just sort of snowballed and took over my life. And I fought it. I fought it. I did not want to become a magician. Uh, magician. I wanted to keep doing theater and film and stuff. And and it just grew and grew and grew. And eventually, one day I grow, I woke up and I went, well, I, I guess I'm a magician now. <laughs> <laughs> that was the best day of your life, man. You never <laughs> look back. What was the hesitancy? How come you didn't want to be a magician? Because I wanted to do, I had a dreams of, you know, you know, directing plays and directing movies. And, you know, and I, I was directing short films and stuff like that. And, and that was, you know, that was, that was, that was the dream. That's what I thought I wanted to do. And that's what, what I was working toward. And magic was just a hobby. And the hobby engulfed me and my entire existence. 
So I know that you, I, I think, I'm 90% sure, didn't you direct uh, Rob Zabrecki and help him bring out his character? Did you yeah. direct short videos and things? Did you do any of those direct? No, not none of the none of the video stuff Rob has, okay. has done, have I had to do with. But I did direct Rob's um uh Rob's stage show that he this was this is going back about ten years, but for about eighteen months he was doing a monthly show at a place here in town called the uh, Steve Allen Theater, which is sort of uh kind of an an alternative uh you know performance space. A lot of great stuff happened there at the Steve Allen. And uh, I directed the show uh, every month for 18 months. And and every month we tweaked the show and, uh, you know, changed it a little bit. But but before that, I gave Rob magic lessons when he first got into magic. Um, and if you had asked me at the time, I would have said, uh, there's no hope for this guy. Because <laughs> uh, oh. magic, it was, it was not a fish to water type situation. Let's just put it that way. Um, but uh, he's a great, great performer. And also he he um, got people like me and Max Maven and he would uh, get advice from us and he listened to us. You know, if we would, you know, say you should try this or don't do this or or try that, he would try it, you know, and uh, wouldn't it wouldn't always stick or wouldn't always work. But um you know, he he listened to our advice and worked his butt off every day of his life. He'd get up and work and work and work. And he just slowly, 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 because he's a great performer, you know, this uh, he brought out this this great magician deep inside of him. So to this t day, he technically is not a great magician. You know, technically uh, he does some sleight of hand. He, he does it well, but he, you know, he he uh, he's. Like I am, you know, I don't say this is an insult because I, I think it's true of me. He's he's somewhat limited in the in the sleight of hand he can do. And I'm somewhat limited too. I'm not a great card magician. All my all my best friends are, you know, the greatest card magicians in the world. I don't I'm not up at up at that level. But Rob being a great performer and a great personality and having a great persona has become everybody's favorite magician in LA. And I uh, you know. And I will take some of the credit for that because I've been there, you know, with him every step of the way. I'm surprised that he didn't take it like a fish to water because seeing the final product, it was like, oh, oh it must have been like a glove and you guys just, I know there's trial and error back putting it together, but it just looks so perfectly in flush. I, I'm surprised that he didn't take it like a fish to water. Yeah, yeah, so, no, it, uh, it was a long journey. So getting back to you, college, getting to the castle, work in the castle. You didn't do the birthday party route. You didn't do, what What gigs did you have starting out? You didn't start naturally, it seems like. No, the, the That's first- like a natural flow in America, yeah. right? Get the a birthday first, party. The first gigs I did were almost all walk around gigs at like uh, uh, private parties and corporate events in LA. You know, LA has a, you know, a lot of companies and there's a lot of Christmas parties and a lot of, you know, company retreats and stuff. And so I, I, I did mostly walk around and, um, and then occasionally you would get also get hired to do stand up stand up gigs uh, there. And I would do that. And I greatly prefer that. I, I never, I did not like doing walk around much. In fact, at one point I got a gig doing walk around magic at a restaurant one day a week. It was Sunday afternoons. It was a, a an upscale burger joint. Uh, they're a burger joint, but a, a very nice sort of fancy burger joint. And Sundays from something like 10 to two, I think, uh, during their brunch hour, uh, uh, I would, I would do walk around and it got to the point that maybe it's, no, I think it was only two hours. It wasn't 10 to two. It was like, it was like noon to two. And doing walk around magic two hours a week was more than I could stand. So after about a year of that, I quit. I'm like, I, I can't take it anymore. <laughs> um, wow. But that was it. It was it was it was all corporate magic. And then uh, I started doing more and more of uh, come to a 45 minute stand up show instead of doing doing the walk around. But that was those were the gigs I did. And then and then I started doing magic conventions, too, which sort of count as gigs and sort of don't. You know. Well, the pay isn't as good. That's for yeah. sure. Yeah. So, um, when did when did uh, your other persona come in? When did Handsome Jack make his appearance? How long were you in 
magic career before yeah. Hanson? Well, well, that's an that is actually a, a a very good question and an interesting part of the story because uh, back when I said I saw all my friends getting booked to the castle, I was like, I I want to do this. I want to play the castle. So I thought I'll take a year to put together an act for the parlor. And at the end of the year, if I think it's good enough, I'll audition. And so I would, I don't know how often, I, I'm going to say once a week, but it was, you know, more likely a couple of times a week. I'd go down to the impromptu rooms of the castle and uh, including what they now call the cellar down at the castle. At the time it was called the museum. Now it's called the cellar. And I'd go down to the cellar and you could gather a crowd and, uh, you know, do a show. You could do, you know, two or three shows a night at the time. And uh, that's how I uh, eventually put the act together. But I began the year thinking that my persona would be sort of a, a not incompetent magician, but a magician who wasn't in control of his magic. So a lot of magical stuff would happen, but it wouldn't be the magical things that I intended or that I was in control of. And the example I'll give you is um, like uh, the 11 card trick. Here I've got 11 cards. Oh, wait. There's only 10. I, I need one more. I want to do the, Oh, there's only 10. I, I need one more. I, I need one more. That kind of thing where I do something and like, wait, that's not right. What happened? You know, things would like vanish on me. And, you know, like, uh, uh, and I, I never did this, but one of the things I was going to work on with this persona was I was going to do a cards across routine. And I said, okay, we need a bridge. You've got You've got some cards, you've got some cards. Now we need to bridge between you two. Let me, here, let me tie these two handkerchiefs together and you each hold on to an end. And I tie the handkerchiefs and they'd hold on to the end and the knot would dissolve. I go, and the knot would dissolve. And I go, here, you tie a knot, you tie a knot. Okay, now you tie, hold the end, you hold the end and the knot would di dissolve. So again, magic's happening, but I'm not, not control. So that was, that was the idea of what I was going to do. And um, I put together like six tricks to do like a 20 minute act. And uh, after performing it a few times, I was like, okay, which trick is working the best for me and which trick is, is working the least. And I will replace the least, the least successful trick with a trick that would go well with the successful trick. And the most successful trick was a win a date with Mr. Magic trick. And it was a trick where I had the game rigged where I'd, I'd bring a woman up from the audience and she'd win a chance to win a prize. And the prize was a date with Mr. Magic, but I secretly had the game rigged. Uh, and she, she was going to win a date. And then at the end it would go wrong. Is it like the game was hundred percent rigged. She's going to win. And then she doesn't win. I'm like, Oh, and so once again, it's like magic happened, but it wasn't magic I intended. And so the audience really responded to that trick for whatever reason. And so I thought, and I was doing this coin trick that wasn't working very well. So I said, okay, I'll stop doing the coin trick. What would work well with the win a day trick? And I came up with something. I don't remember what it was. And I, you know, now I had a slightly new set. And then after a, a month or so, I said, okay, what's the weakest trick now? Let me replace it with that. Set. And over the course of the month, not intentionally. I thought I was going in this direction. This, this, this slightly nebbishy guy. Not close. And over the course of the, you know, the year, eventually, I was going in the exact opposite direction. And I was handsome Jack, male model magician. And if you had told me at the beginning of that year that I was going to be handsome Jack, male model magician, I would have said you're out of your mind. I would have said there's no way I will do that. That sounds stupid. That is not the kind of thing I would do. That's not my kind of humor or comedy. Absolutely not would I ever in a million years do that. Uh, and that's what I was doing by the end of the year, quite unintentionally. But it was because I was paying attention to what was working for me, paying attention to how the audience was responding, pay attention to it, you know, what they liked and what they didn't like and what worked for me and what didn't work for me. And, you know, here I am, you know, 25 years later, I'm handsome Jack. And it's a it's unique so act. No one else is doing that act. That's that's unique. It's fun. It's funny. We didn't get it in 2008. I've told you this off the air. We go on our honeymoon in 2008, and we're like, oh, man, there's Max Maven here. There's uh, It was it was uh, McBride week, so McBride was there. Eugene Berger was there. Max Maven was there in all these rooms, and you had to eat dinner because we weren't a member and yeah. to fulfill. Our, we only had so much time. Well, who's handsome Jack in the basement in the cellar? I don't know. 
who does this guy think he is? And we just skipped you. And I'm like, years later, I'm like, I missed an opportunity to see you perform live, but I've, I've seen you at MAES and other yeah. places. But well, yeah. Well, the, awesome. well, the good good news is I got better. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, so, well, so, um, so what you what you ended up seeing years later was better than what you would have seen then. So that's the that's the bright side. There you go. You just don't have enough time. That week was so busy. People yeah. thought that we arranged our wedding to be there on a McBride week. <laughs> the lines were crazy. I mean, sometimes yeah. you didn't get to that show. You had to wait for the next performance. Yeah. You were waiting yeah. a long time for lines. Yeah. Um, for the audio podcast, I'll put a picture on the Facebook group. But this is Handsome Jack's book. Let me hold this up. Yeah. And um, He performs the pieces and divertissement of the famous Handsome Jack, etc. Or, 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 or abbreviated to Handsome Jack, etc. Who did the illustrations? I did the illustrations. They're wow. awesome. They are amazing. And uh, well, I just pulled this out and looked through it. And I'm like, you know what? This is uh, it's funny. I still haven't finished reading it, man. I got so much on my plate. I got two-year-old twins. I'm blaming them. But I got a lot going on. But you see my bookmark. I'm, I'm, I'm We're yeah. working on it. I'm a quarter of the way through it after six years of MAES. <laughs> but you, uh, Handsome Jack um, signed it to me. And I just think that's awesome. It just says, uh, two Wes. You're welcome. And that's it. That's that's, <laughs> that's all you need to know right there. That's awesome. Thank you that, for that. That is confidence right there. I like it. <laughs> I like it a lot. <laughs> uh, so, I, you know, I want to qualify. Yes, about who did the illustrations. And um, I did the caricatures. There are 30 caricatures in there, which are all uh, drawings of Handsome Jack done in the style of different artists, done in the style of, you know, Picasso or Ralph Steadman or R. Crumb or... Uh, you know, uh, Andy Warhol. I, I did those 30, uh, 30 characters. The illustrations were done by a great uh, artist friend of mine named Robin Fuqua. And then I, I, I you know, tweaked them and Photoshopped them a little bit. Um, uh, but but Robin did did the, you know, 90% of the work on the illustration illustrations. Um, I, I, lo I love it so much. Everything about, you know, just looking through it, just her just thumbing through looking at the pictures. It's fun just for that, man. Uh, there's a Simpsons one. I like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That yeah, was one of them. That was one of the first ones I did. It was, you know, I did those illustrations for a trick, a, a trick where I needed six drawings of me just to cover dead time. And so I did six drawings of me in in different styles, and that was going to be it. And then I thought of, you know, another artist, another. And over the course of a few years, it grew to thirty, and it was kind of a a very fun obsessive obsessive project that I, I i had a lot of fun doing but it took I'll put pictures of that on the facebook group yeah. for the people yeah. That see this. but yeah it's it's awesome yeah. but that's not the only book that's why i was asking because we had david Ginn on two months ago at this point and he has a background in journalism which i didn't mm. know or yeah and, and that's why he's written all those books because he has a background in that uh -huh. but you have put now amazing books and i was like well what else was there journalism in there i'm trying to put the clues together but no no no, no. um i know your switch book and your handsome jack book but what am i missing i know there's a lot in the middle oh man well uh i have i have co-written a lot of books as far as books that i wrote entirely uh, i'm not gonna be able to remember for sure you know the books i've worked on because I've, I've in you know i have i've written co-written consulted on written parts of done heavy 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 copy editing on and then just proofread you know dozens and dozens and dozens of books but as far as books that I've, that I've written uh is i wrote uh the the bill switch book it's called switch unfolding the hundred dollar bill change switch um the uh the steve mayhew book it's called what women want the steve mayhew book uh the handsome jack etc book i wrote an astonishing essay which is a uh a short book uh a short book length essay for vanishing Ink called get out of my way i'm going to hell which i think is maybe the best thing i've ever written um and then i've co-written i co-wrote uh repertoire aussie wins book i co-wrote um uh uh before we begin an uh, aussie wins book about pre-show i co-wrote the paper engine aaron fisher's book uh I just wrote a book uh, about the card magic of Al Arino, uh that just came out. I co-wrote uh, Piff's book. Piff, it's called Piff the Magic Book. 
that just came out. And I just co-wrote two volumes of uh, The Card Magic of Alan Ackerman that'll be coming out later. Uh, and I'm in the process of, <laughs> of writing a five volume set of the complete works of Penn and Teller, uh, which I'm about halfway through. It's five volumes because it's gonna be one volume per decade, uh, starting with the 80s, then the 90s, the aughts, the teens and the 20s. Uh, every trick they've ever done on stage, I don't cover any of their TV work, but just all their stage work. And they have created a lot of stage magic. So anything they've done on stage, even tricks they only did like for a week back in the 90s, uh, 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 I write about. So um, uh, I'm 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 uh, I'm writing that. What about their spots that they're they're developing just for television, like the Fula stuff that if, they're coming up with? If they perform it on stage, it goes in the book. You know? Okay. And so so the stuff they do on Foolis, some of the stuff they do on Foolis, they do it in their stage show, uh, and then they they shoot it for Foolis, and they never do it again. But most of it, they do it on stage, they shoot on Foolis, and then they still do it occasionally afterwards. Most of it, um, they do stuff on Foolis that they don't do on stage. They put it together, uh, rehearse it, like, you know, rehearse it in the studio, as they say, and then uh, then shoot it, and it never makes it to the stage. But if it makes it to the stage to get into shape for Foolis, it usually gets to a point where it's, it's good enough that they actually keep it in the repertoire uh you know occasionally so i thought uh, they i thought they were working all that new stuff out the 20 new bits in a in a nine week period 10 week they can't do all of that on oh, stage every yeah this year they shot 20 bits for the for the season and i would say that of the 20 bits probably eight of them they did on stage and 12 of them they just put together for tv that's my guess without knowing the exact breakdown Okay. Okay. And those and those well, those eight new things uh, this year are really great. And like you know anything, you 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 put together ten new tricks in a year. Not all ten of them are going to be winners for anybody, no matter who you are. But the 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 eight new things they put into the show within the last year are all really solid. You know, a couple of them are among the best things they've ever done. Yeah. And you know this. But isn't it funny how you can have a trick in your show for five years and it's it's a trick in your show. It sort of verifies you like it, but just one little piece sets it over the edge to be your favorite trick now. It's your now your favorite trick. It's like I've had it for years, but that one little piece. So you got to sometimes put them away and bring them back. And yeah, do yeah I'm, like that. I'm, I, I never stop tweaking my stuff. Uh, things that I've been doing, uh, in fact, this this uh this bill switch routine of steve mayhew's and it's in the mayhew book it's also in the bill switch book it's steve mayhew's and for a long time i was the only person in the world doing doing that routine um uh steve would maybe do it uh, in uh if he got hired to do a stand-up show at, at corporate you know for a corporate rich but he didn't do a lot of that work he mostly did did close-up magic so even he the um you know, inventor of the trick didn't do it often. But so I've been doing that trick for well over 20 years. I, I opened every show with it for, you know, a good 15 years. Then I stopped doing it for about 10 years. And then I brought it back recently, uh, you know, just before, just before the pandemic actually started doing it. And I tweaked it, you know, I made two kind of significant changes and it was great, great, no flaws, but, you know, it made it better. I ne never stopped tweaking my stuff, always. <laughs> When can we start pre-ordering that book? Oh well, that is that's that's a question. Here's the deal. Uh, I've been working on it for about two years. It's about half done. I will probably, in all likelihood, have finished the writing of it in another two years. But then the problem is going to be photographing and illustrating it because they're so busy trying to get trying to work photo shoots into their schedule is going to be difficult even photo shoots that don't involve them and are just pictures of the props will be difficult because that would require their crew to go down to the you know they have they, they have stuff stored in like five different facilities all over town and that would require digging stuff out of storage 
lugging it to the theater, setting it up, photographing it. Uh, they're so busy and their crew is so busy. I honestly don't know how and when we're going to get these books illustrated. So that's going to be the, the big challenge. So the books, they're going to be released one at a time. Going to be released one at a time. Uh, but the first one, I don't think the first one will be out in less than two years from now. Uh, if, you know, if I could magically have the photos and illustrations done somehow, if I could go there and take pictures I wanted whenever I wanted, uh, I would get them done and get the book out in a year. But it, it's not going to happen within a year. I hope I hope it'll come out within two years. But, you know, they'll they'll be worth the wait. That's all I'll say. These books are incredible. They are so smart. And their methods are so good and so complex and so interesting. These books and these books give away everything, the complete scripting, every detail of everything they've ever done. And these are these are going to be worth the wait. Well, we talked a couple of weeks ago because you were asking me about Flip because they were using Flip in the show. So I'll That's be in great. book five. You will so, be in volume five. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So I have to wait how long? 15 years? <laughs> Maybe, <laughs> no prediction, but maybe, yeah. One day, one day, my kids yeah. will they'll get it for their grandpa. My, yeah. my grandkids yeah. will get it for me one day. There you go. So uh, let's talk about your love of Penn and Teller. You said you have the world's largest collection of Penn and Teller memorabilia, mm -hmm. and your Fula spot. Tell us about that. Um. Yes. Okay. The collection. So here's. Uh, I here's the way it started in 1995. I read the incredible, very lengthy interview with Penn and Taylor that Jamie Ian Swiss conducted in Genie Magazine. Um, and it blew my mind. Uh, they were working on a level that no other magicians I was aware of were working. And I, I'd been a fan of them because I first saw them, their off-Broadway show in 1985, 10 years before. I just graduated from college. I was in New York. I'd read about them in Life magazine and I saw the show and loved it and then would see them on TV occasionally after that. But in 95, I read this interview with them in Genie magazine and it blew me away that about what complete, deep and profound artists they are in, in addition to being incredible magicians. And so I said, I want to read every interview that's ever been done with them or read everything they've ever written or everything about them. And I started collecting magazine articles about them. And I did, I, I, you know, I did deep, deep research to find every magazine articles about them I could. I, uh, using, I go to the library and use the, um, the, the, the guide to periodicals, I think it was, it was called. I don't even know if they do still do the guide to periodicals. They probably do, but just not in book form. It's probably all online now. But you'd go to the guide to periodicals and you'd look up Penn and Teller and it'd say, you know, Time Magazine in November 14th of this year, there's a little article mention of them. And I'd go through and I'd find all those magazines or I'd go to the library at the Magic Castle and I'd go, you know, look. But this is before the days of Ask Alexander, the great thing from Conjuring Arts. And I'd flip through all the genie magazines and all the magic magazines and see if there was an article uh, uh, mention of them. And so uh, eventually I started collecting and buying all these magazines with, with stuff about them and then the books they would they would read. And so I was just collecting magazine articles and then and reading it and just like absorbing it and absorbing their philosophy and their thinking and everything. And then that uh, that sort of then I started, you know, collecting like, you know, Penn and Teller postcards or Penn and Teller photos or, or, or posters or you know, you know, refrigerator magnets or whatever. And and that just sort of grew and grew and grew until after like 20 years, it's like, oh my God, I've got an enormous Penn and Teller collection. And so what I was doing was I was preparing to write these books. I just didn't know that's what I was doing. Um, uh, and the, uh, the, the collection still, you know, just continued to this day i still add to the collection constantly uh, a little tangent on that my favorite parts of the collection is the asparagus valley collection do you know about the, the asparagus 
Hispanics Valley Cultural Society? I do, but our listeners yeah. probably don't. A, a lot of a lot of listeners probably don't. So before they were a duo, they were in a trio with a a, a musicologist named Weir Chrisimer, named the Asparagus Valley Cultural Society. And back then, Penn, Penn was really just a juggler. So they had a juggler, a magician, and a musician did this show together. And they did the show in several cities, most significantly in San Francisco. It ran for something like two and a half years in San Francisco in the late 70s. It was very successful. It was a big hit. They were, they were, they were the talk of the town with this scrappy little show. And they were like, they were all in, in their late 20s at the time. Um, and this show was a big hit. Um, and then after the show closed, Weird the musicologist left the group because uh, he wanted to have a more stable life. And so Penn and Taylor co continued as a duo and they did the Penn and Taylor show in LA and that led to them going to uh, to New York. But I've got a big, big folder of Asparagus Valley stuff. And a very, Asparagus Valley stuff is very hard to find. It's very rare because they only existed for six years. And that was, you know, in the 70s. And they also weren't huge the way they are now. So there's much less. But I've got like eight different Asparagus Valley posters. And I've got um, uh, their publicity packets and contracts and letters and newspaper articles anyway uh bumper stickers that's that's the part of the collection i love uh anyway so i over the 20 some years that i've been collecting well i guess now it's it's getting close to 30 years i've been collecting their stuff and like i said collecting their stuff has been prepping to write this book i just didn't know that's what, what i was doing so then um then so is book one is book one going to be asparagus valley included or do you only so, start with sort of Sort of, because it's you kind of uh, uh, the introduction, and I don't know if it, it's technically going to be an introduction, but it's going to going to have a ch the beginning of every book will have what right now I'm referring referring to as a, as an introduction, but but I don't know how it'll actually be titled, which is the summary of their career during that decade. So the '80s is this is or the '90s, for example, will be what happened to them in the '90s? What did they do? Uh, what you know? What Broadway runs did they do? What TV specials did they do? How was their magic evolving and changing? Uh, every day to do that. But the volume one, which covers the Penn and Teller work in the eighties, because the first the first time they worked together as Penn and Teller was, I believe, in nineteen eighty three. So Penn Penn and Teller as Penn and Teller began in eighty three. But I write about how they met and their career. And I write about Asparagus Valley uh, in that introduction, uh, write about Asparagus Valley and the kinds of stuff Asparagus Valley does. And then, but the 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 material that they do is that I write about in the book is only the Penn and Teller material. But some of the Penn and Teller material uh, is based on Asparagus Valley material. And so there's a lot of Asparagus Valley information in the book but not explicitly, only if it directly uh, crosses paths with Penn and Teller material. Okay. I was asking, because I'm such a huge fan, I want to see Asparagus posters I haven't seen. I wasn't born until 77. Yeah. I didn't get to see those. I would yeah, love yeah. to see them. Yeah, yeah. I, I love I, I love my Asparagus Valley collection. Um, and then you asked about uh, appearing on Foolis. Um, so here's my, here's my, and that was, boy, that must have been, Eight, eight or nine years ago. It must have been about nine years ago now. I, I don't know exactly when it was. But uh, this was the first American season of Foolish. They had done one season in the UK. And then I think it was about four years later or so that they did the first American season, which which they which is they call season two. But they were like, oh, there was a four-year gap. And it was the first American season. And all my friends were getting calls for it to be on to be on Foolish. And, and, and so I actually worked with several friends of mine who were like, I'm, I'm putting together this thing for Foolish. Will you work with me? And so I consulted with them and helped them with the thing and uh, rehearsed with them and gave them advice, which is, you know, something I do for uh, a, a lot of people. Uh, but, and, and then, so a lot of my friends were going to go on, be on Foolish. And I thought, ah, it might be fun to be on that show, but I don't know what I would do. And, I didn't have that much interest in being on television anyway. So 
but I felt a little bit like, uh huh, no one's asking me. And then like the week before shooting started, you know, they contacted me about being on the show. I was like, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, maybe. L let me think. And so I tried to think about what I could do that would fool them. And so I put together a couple of tricks. I thought these might fool them. And I I tried them out at the castle in one of the impromptu rooms. And they just did not play because, you know, you can't throw together a trick or it's rare you throw together a trick and it works like gangbusters out, out of the gate. So it just it just didn't play. It just uh, didn't have the, you know, uh, enough um, performances to make it entertaining. And I thought, geez, I don't know. And so uh, Derek Hughes, great friend of mine from Minneapolis, uh, said, just do the grappler. Uh, just do the grappler. It's 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 one of your strongest pieces. You close with it. It'll be a great TV, and who cares if you pull them? You'll have something good for your re reel. And I realized he was right. Uh, and so I decided to do the grappler. And they said, send this video of like six tricks. Submit six tricks. And I sent the vid them video of one trick. I sent them video of the grappler. I said, this is what I'm going to do. And they said, great, do it. So, so uh, I put together the, the grappler and uh went to shoot and like i said this is our first season and i was i was uh i was uh, uh scheduled to 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 shoot on on their first day of filming and the day before the day, the day before i shot someone said so do you think you're going to fool them and i said i know for a fact i'm going to fool them i also know for a fact i'm not going to fool them and it all depends on what aspect of the trick they choose to focus on and 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 that and that's basically true of almost everybody on the show to various degrees is like there's some tricks they know 100 percent exactly everything about the trick there's some tricks they know nothing about what happened but i would say 80 percent of the tricks they know some of it sometimes the percentage is 20 percent. sometimes the percentage is 80 percent but d whether they focus on the 20 percent that, that fooled them or the 80% that didn't, or vice versa, you'll get a trophy or not, depending on what they focus on. Like the, the day I shot, Dave Regal fooled them, or Dave Regal appeared. And part of what Regal did fool them, I guarantee you part of what he did fool them. Part of it didn't. They focused on the part that didn't fool them. He didn't get a trophy. They focused on the part for me that did fool them, and I got a trophy. So I, I feel very fortunate that way. And, and the story behind that, it's kind of an amusing story, is... Nobody and the crew, uh, the producers or, you know, Johnny Thompson or Mike Close who were consulting, nobody expected me to fool them. They just thought I was doing this funny trick where I I, I drop my pants, um, you know, get a laugh and get a piece of footage and that's it. So they never asked how the trick was done. And so, so for those of you who know, I'm going to back up and explain what I did. So the grappler is a, a, was a, 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 a presentational thing of, of Harry Anderson's that I bought. I bought the rights to perform from Harry Anderson, where he did a, a bill switch trick. And then as a fake explanation, he showed how he used the Keplinger holdout to accomplish the trick. And so he said, what you didn't notice, he didn't notice when I dropped my pants and hooked my knees together. And then I was able to do this and it shows the, the workings of the Keplinger. Very, very funny sight gag with uh, him accomplishing his trick by dropping his pants and showing the Keplinger. So I bought that, uh, you know, the rights to do that from Harry. But I didn't want to do a bill switch trick for a number of reasons. And so I thought, well, I'll do a torn and restored trick. I mean, it took me a long time to figure out what trick to do. But I ended up doing this torn and restored piece of paper trick. And and the Keplinger would be a fake explanation. Uh, and that was it. It ends with a sight gag. And Derek Delgadio, a good, good buddy of mine, said, you know what? you should have a kicker ending where you show that the the Keplinger grabs the torn pieces and yanks them up your sleeve and switches them for the untorn pieces. And that's how the trick works. But then, like the sucker napkin, torn or stored napkin, take those torn pieces out and uh, restore those. Brilliant idea. You know, that's that's why... That's why the God is a genius or an example of, of him being a genius. And so that's what I did. And so now I had a, an ending to the trick, which Harry never did have an ending. It was just a sight gag. And it's a great sight gag. 
Now I took out a surprise ending. And so Johnny and Mike never asked how the, how, how the trick was done. And they also didn't know that I was going to hand out the flyer at the end. And so the two times we rehearsed it for camera, we did it in a room and the director was there and the camera people were there and the producers were there. And there was a camera man just sitting just off of where the camera is. And I finished it and I would just hand it to him because he was sitting where Teller would be sitting. And no one that really never registered it anyone. I didn't say, and then I'm going to hand it to Teller. I just handed it to him, but that really didn't register for them. And so I do the thing, I perform, I get done. I do the instant restoration of the, of the torn pieces. I run down and I hand it to Taylor and I go, that's for you. That's for you. And then I ran back up and they were like flummoxed because as they said, when they were debating is like, usually with the torn restore thing, you can't hand it out because the item is dirty. This is not dirty. Uh, then they had a guess about what, and they were wrong about the guess. So, so, so I won. And I think they were so surprised in the booth that I fooled them. They didn't put up that big fool or graphic in the background. <laughs> I'm the only person who ever fooled them who didn't get the fooler graphic in the background. So I don't, I don't have a screen grab of me standing in front of the big fooler background. The only one because no one thought I was going to fool them. So anyway. So but you're I, good with, good with uh, the, 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 the computer trophy. thing. No, what's the computer thing? Oh, what's the the, editing, yeah, the yeah. editing software that you did. What is it called? I'm, I'm blanking. Oh. Uh, uh, the you, editing software yeah. that you did to tweak your photos. What is that called? Oh, I, I use Photoshop. Photoshop. You can put Photoshop yourself in front of it. I could. You? I 100% won, I won could if I cared enough. <laughs> okay. Yeah. okay. All right. There you go. Yeah. There you go. So, so, so the kicker to the story is... Penn and Taylor, and I was I, I was the last person to shoot that day, and and the only one and the only one to fool them that day, only one to fool them, and the last one to shoot. And they go backstage afterwards, and they go to Johnny and Mike, and they say, "How did Handsome Jack do that?" And Johnny and Mike said, "We don't know." And they're like, "What do you mean you don't know?" And they said, "I didn't know he was going to hand it to you." And so Taylor emailed me. He said, "You fooled us." And uh, Johnny and Mike think you did, Mike thinks you did this. Johnny thinks you did that. I think they're both wrong. And I emailed back, I said, yes, they're both wrong. And then he said, well, what did you do? And I said, well, you know, I, I gave him a hint. So I, I, I stretched this out over three days, you know, give him hints. <laughs> and so I said, you're going to be really upset when I tell you. You're going to be really mad at yourself when I tell you. And so I, I emailed him. And the last thing I said was, I fooled you with what I think literally might be the oldest method in magic, finger palming. I took those pieces and I finger palmed them. And I said, that's for you. You know, and this hand, this hand, I said, that's for you. I, I finger palmed the pieces. And he loved it. He thought so great to be so sort of elegantly uh, and ingeniously fooled by something he should know. He loved it. He loved it. Um, and so I was telling a non-magician friend this story about how I said, I fooled you with one of the oldest, with maybe the oldest trick of magic, finger palming. And she goes, what's finger palming? I said, well, it means when you hide something in your hand. And she said, well, I don't know a lot about magic, but I've always assumed that sometimes magicians hide things in their hands. And I said, yes, that's true. Sometimes they do. And Penn and Taylor should know that. Uh, so... So that's my story. And so for a long time, when people said, you know, asked, did you fool Penn and Taylor? I would say, Penn and Taylor, I fooled Johnny and Mike. <laughs> yeah, there you go. That's yeah. awesome. That's a, that's a triple, quadruple whammy there. Yeah. That's yeah. awesome, man. So uh, I got a whole bunch of stuff here. Yeah. What about your Real Magic interviews? That was the first time I remember seeing oh, boy. you. Did you enjoy doing those? That was fun. Because well, you took on my work, the interviewer. Yes, um, that was, uh, you know, Cosmo, Cosmo, who produced those, asked me to teach my handling of the bill switch on the very first one. And so I did that. He, we met somewhere. I think it was at a convention. I don't really remember where we shot it. Uh, and we shot it and I taught the bill switch. And I was kind of not in a great mood and I didn't know that I wanted to do it. And, and 
Cosmo kind of rubbed me the wrong way. And so I was kind of a jerk to him the way I, I can be. Um, and I was kind of a, a jerk and I thought, I'll shoot this and whatever. There you go. And then he, and then he asked me, Hey, would you interview people for me on this series? Which just, I was such a jerk to him. I couldn't believe he asked me to do these interviews. I'm like, sure. And so it just became a thing. Every time there was a convention, he said, ask a couple of people and interview them. And I started doing it. And and I had so much fun doing those. Uh, I interviewed, you know, Mac King and Dave Williamson and Max Maven and Aussie Wind and the Buck Brothers and Bill Malone and Guy Hollingworth and Zabrecki and, you know, I don't know who else. Of course, but... Costanza too, right? Oh, oh yeah. And oh, that's right. That was one of the first ones was um, um, uh, Jason Alexander, who played, yeah. who played George Costanza on Seinfeld. Because I was good friends with Jason at the time. I'm still good friends with him. Uh, uh, but I was I was touring with him at the time. Uh, he had a one one man show, a comedy show that he was doing. And I was his entire tech crew. Uh, and so I was touring with him at the time. And I'm, I'm still in touch with him. He's the, that was like 10 years ago, but we're, he's just the greatest guy. And so, yes, the Jason Alexander, that was a great interview. Um, I loved it. Yeah, that was great. Um, so, yeah, I just did those for Cosmo. And then I don't know if Cosmo is still doing him, but he's sort of stopped asking me. And, yeah, I don't know what the situation was there. I think they're doing everything online. Just pay me yeah. per I'll teach you some tricks, but it's not yeah. really what it used to be. I yeah. like the DVD. I like, I don't know. I'm old school like that. I want to hold the DVD. I want to collect the DVDs. Yeah. If it's got a digital download somewhere, I don't know what folder it's in. It doesn't, I don't yeah. see it every day. So I forget about it. Yeah. I'm, 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 I'm the same way about that kind of stuff. Yeah. yeah. So dude, that's uh, we got nine minutes left. Holy smokes, man. I need to learn to talk more concise. Yo, concision. Concision. I say that's what I should so, learn. I saw you at magic live. Uh, and I'm telling, I'm describing this to Natalie. He was playing with a hunk of cheese and having other men play with a hunk of cheese. <laughs> Does that okay. sound like fun? No. <laughs> <laughs> it was, but it was a really big hunk of cheese. It was a really <laughs> big, a really big hunk of cheese. Now, right, now, what do you think? No. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you got to talk about the cheese real quick. Well, well the what's cheese. Going on? Well, the okay. Uh, most m most listeners will know about the mighty cheese, uh, which is oh, uh, all the non magician listeners definitely know the mighty cheese. Yeah. So so yeah. the mighty cheese, in a nutshell, it's it's the trick is 111 years old. It was P.T. Selbit, P.T. Selbit, who was the first person to do, basically saw a woman in halves. Um, he he invented the first version of. Uh, and he called his, I think that's what he called his sawing a woman in halves, I think is what he called his. Um, uh, but he invented uh, 10 years, 10 or 11 years before he invented um, uh, the sawing a woman. He invented the mighty cheese, which was a big, it was about, I'd say two feet in diameter. It looked like a big hunk of, uh, like a big wheel of cheese. And uh, he'd bring people up from the audience. And the object was to pin the cheese to the ground and no one could. They try and push it over and it would spin around and 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 no one could do it. And and he um, had this great three sheet poster, the Mighty Cheese, which is one of the great magic posters of all time. And that's why we remember the Mighty Cheese uh, because of that poster and not because of the trick because it's a terrible trick. No one, he could not make it play. It was in his act for a short time. He tried to make it entertaining. He used stooges. He put his stooges on roller skates, thinking the roller sta skates would make it funnier. It was not good. And a few other magicians, like Les Levant, the Australian magician, put in their act. It didn't last very long because it's a terrible trick. But because of the name, the Mighty Cheese, which is such a dumb name, and that great poster, magicians still, it's still legendary, and magicians covet that poster. And if I had room for a three-sheet poster and had the money, I would buy a three uh, a mighty cheese poster but anyway john gunn built a replica of the mighty cheese for the magic history conference some years ago and stan said let's get the john gunn replica and present it and show people what it was like and i'm stan asked me if i would project present it and i said absolutely so i feel very 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 honored that i got to present the mighty cheese uh at the history conference and had like 
15 rounds, had 15 people wrestle the cheese. And uh, it, it was fun. People got to see it, most seeing it for the first time ever and seeing the poster displayed with it. Yeah, that's that's what I got out of it. I saw it on Facebook and I'm like, I have seen the poster, but I, I couldn't imagine what it was. I didn't remember yeah. reading about the Mighty Cheese and Magic Books yeah. and seeing it live. It's like, well, there is something there, but boy, it is silly. That's yeah, just it, a silly. It, yeah, it's a very silly thing and very difficult to make actually entertaining. But it is it is kind of fun, but it's not worth it's not worth the trouble, you know. Yeah, yeah. Well, where can people find you? Website, Facebook. Well, uh, I'm on face, you know, I'm on Facebook, John Lovick on Facebook. Um uh and I've got a website that's you know uh was update last updated probably 15 years ago, but it's handsomejack.com. And my contact information is there. If anybody wants to email me about anything or you know has a question or uh, you know, has something they want to talk about, uh, go to handsomejack.com. You can shoot me an email there or even call me. Uh, it's got my phone number. Um, that and Facebook, John Lovick on Facebook. You're the best, man. This was awesome. Thank you for your time. Thank you for being on here. Yeah. We'll have to do it again sometime. Okay, thanks like a lot, Wes. Uh, You're the hope, best. Hope I wasn't too long-winded. You weren't no. long-winded at all, man. This no. was awesome. Yeah. I have right. other stuff to talk about, but we'll get to it next time. Okay. All I have left to say is uh, see you next week. Great. Bye. Check us out online at wesisley.com and patreon.com forward slash Wes underscore Isley for behind the scene videos, blooper videos, never before seen footage, discounts on merchandise, magic trick tutorials, and more. That's Wes Isley spelled W-E-S-I-S-E-L-I. -S -E